and ultimately I think one of the things that's most intrinsic to what makes theater different from television and film is the presence of an in-person audience. Uh, and that's something that we, uh, we only experience in theaters, whether or not what we are seeing is theater. Having an audience is great because someone else is sharing in that story. If we look around, it's very difficult to be a theater artist during this pandemic. Having an audience, like an actual real one, like right there in front of you is just fantastic. So the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, um, it's a Greek myth, and Orpheus is a musician. Uh, Eurydice is sometimes uh, known as his muse. Uh, and on their wedding day, Eurydice gets bitten by a snake and she dies. In one way or another, Eurydice dies and goes to the underworld. And Orpheus, compelled by his love, needs to go down there to save her. Um, and she's living her own life down there. In this play, she meets her father, which is kind of a fun little twist. And since Orpheus is so grief-stricken, he goes down to the underworld to get her back. And he does this by playing music, which I believe in the myth it says something like, the music is so sad, it makes the rocks weep. But there's one rule that as they leave Hades, he must be in front of her and he must not look back. He looks back just to make sure she's there. And so he fails and Eurydice dies again and is stuck in the underworld. And everyone's sad. The story just ends sad. <laughs> At the moment, this looks like it is a, in a position of great distress. Um, that, that, is, uh, that is because it is currently in process. My name is Eric Van Tassel. I am the lighting designer for this fall's production of Eurydice from Hope College. The amount of time that I typically spend, or under normal circumstances would spend as a lighting designer, actually, as we jokingly say, swinging a wrench, uh, acting as an electrician, is usually relatively little, right? My, my, my job would typically to be supervise a group of students and make sure that they are executing those things so that I can function as designer. Well I, just, I want to clarify that I understand this lightning thing. Do I have to bring the slider up then? No, you don't have to do the slider at all. So the two buttons at the bottom of the slider, uh -huh. uh, the bottom button, the one that your finger is on, is the bump button. Uh, take your stage light fader and fade, pull it down just a little bit. To pull it down to like 30 feet up so people can still see if they need you. Uh, and just tap that bu that button. Yeah. So if you want, or something like that, looks like light. I got rhythm. There it is. You got rhythm. You got music. You got your light board. Who could ask for anything? Yep. Yep. The days where I feel like that. <laughs> and I'm happily married. Oh my god. Last year, the I spent a lot more time executing my own and, uh, and my colleagues' designs uh, so that we could work without putting as many students in danger or having them need to work with each other in close proximity. The 2020-2021 the school year, we had the ability to plan ahead and make sure that we were fulfilling the needs of our, of our students and of our department. So we worked really hard. One of the challenges was that we couldn't use student crews as much as we normally do. So the amount of individual effort by individual faculty and staff was significantly higher. Last year, because of the pandemic, the timing of the retirement of our scenic design professor resulted in us not being able to hire an, a, a new scenic design professor immediately. We had to design in-house, and we don't have a resident scenic designer. So our tech, technical director, Stephen Krebs, and Eric Van Tassel, our lighting and sound designer, and Ken, a staff lighting and sound technician and sometime designer. I mean, everybody jumped up and did extra work. One of the ways that this production of Eurydice is unique uh, as far as past productions at Hope is our work with an outside scenic designer. That's not to say that, we're not, that we aren't familiar with using scenic designers that are not part of our department. Uh, that happens pretty regularly. But, um, so Lisa Borton, who is our scenic designer here for this production, uh, she is also a graduate of Hope College. She's actually new to the Holland area, mo moved back here just this summer. So I was, I think, approached by Michelle maybe in late July. They you know, needed a scenic designer for the year. 
It kind of came out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it. I hoped that when I moved back to Holland, I would have some opportunities here. And so then when it came, I was totally surprised. And uh, she's a fantastic scenic designer, but she also has uh, is in the midst of a career change and sort of has a new day job um, in addition to do, being a scenic designer. Technically, just the stairs that I'm going to be using and how those are going to move and stuff, like to get onto that platform a lot, like that's a little bit mm -hmm. like I don't like. Right. I, I, it's just like I don't know. So like that's the only thing for yeah. And for we me just have to be prepared and yeah. tech to take enough time that you guys are comfortable and we might have an idea and it might not work. So then we have to come up with another idea mm -hmm. because we haven't had the set to really get to know. We have to yeah. give ourselves the time to do that, and because it's a short enough play. I think we will have the time to do that. Sure. Um, I know that Lisa was talking to me about the string house, but I don't know when it's going to be. Yes, anytime she wants to come by and stop rehearsal so we can figure it out, but I don't think they're ready to do it. So that's probably going to be part of tech. But maybe she would stop by Thursday if she has something ready by then. I'm also hoping that you're kind of getting itchy to put it together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you should. So right now I like that we're not. So it's like, your horse is waiting at the gate. So that Wednesday and Thursday, the intent is for you guys to put it together and feel confident about where we've arrived, feel like you have, you know, a journey to go on. Because as I've said before, when we go into tech, there'll be a lot of new things for us. And so we'll lose a lot of what we think the play is about is we have to solve all the technical issues, but knowing that we've been there will then give us the confidence to get back there. If not Sunday night, a tap tech run, hopefully by Monday's tap run. At one point in my career, in my education, somebody said anytime you add a circle to a set, it increases the budget and the time by three. So this entire set having a large rotating round shaped unit I knew was going to be a challenge. Anytime there's moving pieces and parts I get a little bit nervous and so I think figuring out those transitions and taking the time to figure out who's supposed to be standing at a certain place, also making sure that the actors can say their lines while they're doing that thing. Great, already on the okay. It's such a short thing. To so, knock, knock. Don't get on it yet, because we're okay. cause we'll, we'll put you on there when yeah. we do this. When, when, when we move back. So, restore back to one. Watching our uh, single strut as our answer, and it's there. And I'll tell you what, I would suggest actually doing because this sounds this it seems silly, but rather than going from from here, going here, going here, going back. Unbreak, move, break, go. In a stage note, Sarah Rule is talking about the sound of dripping water is present. And so, A of all, I like lights, and I like lights in a set, and I think that they're lots of fun, and they can give the lighting designer something to play with, and also giving the world sort of a, like, creepy, weird kind of shape. Um, exposed light bulbs are definitely a thing that show up on sets a lot and so initially I wanted to wrap them in in that weird it's yarn um, like large quilting yarn uh, wrap them in that and then you know we sort of wrapped half of them and we started tech process out with half of them wrapped and I said to Dinah you know do you like those I'm not sure if they're looking as clean as I want them to and she said well that that's what makes them weird like we don't want raw light bulbs we want weird um, and so being able to, to kind of give the world also some vertical height was important because really the only other vertical element is the, the rotating unit on the set and it caps out at, I think, eight feet in the air. And so you have another 12 feet vertically that you kind of want to look at filling and at least creating a full picture. I rely on everybody else doing their work. You have to have some ability as a director to see how all these pieces do fit into this picture, which doesn't mean that there can't be dissonance or collision or juxtaposition, but that everything on stage matters and everything, every choice should be a choice. 
And if you haven't made one, you've made one, because <laughs> it will be there. I'm grateful that I had designers that were game and that have done their work so that I can respond to their work and I might go, oh, how about this? How about that? Solving how the string room is created. There was an idea and we kept on changing the idea to make it easier for the actor. Did the idea sometimes come from me? Yes. It came from the designer? Yes. Different people might, again, voice different ways of solving something. So that's what's actually the most fun as a director is watching other people step up and do their best work. We're fortunate that we have a team here that has worked together enough that we trust each other uh, and are confident enough in each other's abilities uh, to, to make the right choice and to make a choice that will uh, support not only our own field, but the rest of the production at large. My name is Lydia Konings, and on Eurydice, I was a stage manager. In my opinion, a stage manager is a facilitator of communication. So I send a lot of emails. I sit in on all the rehearsals. I sit in on the production meetings. I'm the person taking notes, making sure everything goes smoothly. And then during tech week and during the show, I'm the person calling the cues. So for people who don't know, every single time that a lighting or a sound thing happens, or in this production, we actually have light bulbs that come in and down. Um, that's all a cue that I have to call. And so the designers will give me their cue list and then I call the whole show. So every time something happens that's not actor related, it was me telling people to do it. So if we can just um, take it from, I grew up in Houston, Texas, and I grew up in Houston, Texas. Sometimes it can be hard because I've seen this show hundreds of times at this point, but I really appreciated just how beautiful this show is. It's kind of hard to picture that until you get into Tech Week, but I was literally blown away and it's hard to not be immersed in the show every single night. Like, I feel like I'm right there with the actors, like I'm looking up. At this point, I think I had most of my cues actually memorized, so I didn't even have to look in my call book very often. Something that Dinah said early on when we started this process together is that she really wanted stage managers who were able to kind of like get out of their books, which I think is really an interesting concept because I think for a lot of stage managers, you're so focused on like, what does the script say? What does my call book say? Um, but she really emphasized she wanted someone who was able to like be there for the artistic process as well and to be able to like get out of that and really just see the show for what it is, which I personally try to do as well in my like stage managing style. So I really appreciated that. But it was just like a really fun process to be able to kind of like do that call and response with the actors because I'm just there in the booth responding to what the actors are doing on stage and making sure they're lit up and things like that. But it's just fun. I really enjoyed it. My name is Greer Gardner. I am the student costume designer for Eurydice. One thing that I really love about costume design is just like it's, I feel like it's the cherry on top. It's the last thing you add at the end of tech week and it's the final puzzle piece. It just transports you into this world of wherever this play is taking place. Um, another thing that I really love is there's a lot of symbolism in costume design and I love analyzing the characters and um, the script to find little things, hidden things to portray within my costumes. In the script for Eurydice, uh, the playwright, Sarah, she wrote that she was gonna be in a lot of different like time period where like clothing. So we kind of wanted to stick with that saying like, she's going on this trip, she's traveling, she's going through this adventure, it's her story. So that's why I tried to pick with their swimsuit at the beginning was the 60s and her wedding dress was the 50s and then more of like 80s or 90s for her slip dress in the underworld. And I went with a slip dress. Originally it was written to be a uh, traveling suit from the 30s, um, but we went with a slip dress of kind of like she fell out of her wedding dress and that was the dress underneath or kind of also a play on nowadays where a lot of weddings, the bride will have her ceremony dress and then a reception dress she changes into. So that also goes along with why she wasn't wearing shoes is she fell out of them too. We have to have masks, they have to wear them, but I wanted them to go along with their costumes, coordinate well so that they didn't stick out, so that it did kind of just incorporate into their costumes in 
it looked natural and they wasn't this big obvious thing that wasn't you wouldn't think was supposed to be there which I felt when I was watching the tech rehearsals that I just sometimes even forgot that they were wearing masks which might just be because we're so used to seeing them now. I'm in the forefront, I'm the person that they're talking to which I'm kind of shy so it's been a little hard to get used to but I definitely feel like it's helped me grow with my confidence of being able to speak to these people who are my professors and be like, hey, these are my designs, like, I'd love your feedback, um, this is what I'm thinking, and to get up in front of them and show this work, which it's like vulnerable to show people stuff that you're so passionate about and wanting them to approve of your work. And so yeah, it's been really helpful with my confidence to be able to step into this leadership role and be the main person in charge. My name is Zach Pickle. I uh, play the uh, nasty, interesting man and the child. I was kind of going back and forth on whether or not I wanted to audition. That's always kind of the, the first question that I really have is, do I have the time? Do I have the space to make this work in this semester? But this semester I took a look at my schedule and I thought, well, I, I, I think I have it in my, in my schedule. I should be able to audition. I hadn't heard of the play beforehand, so I took the took the time to read it through a couple times, get to know the characters a little bit. That's a really important part of the audition process is understanding what the, what it is that you're auditioning for. It helps you, it, it informs what monologues you're using and what the, what the vibe of your character is. I've been in about four productions. This character in some ways breaks the mold of what I've done in the past, but in other ways, I, I have a foundation of roles that I can kind of pull from. The, as far as the child scenes goes, I have never done anything that, that compares. There's just such a chaos there. There is a freedom of, of, of expression that Dinah gave me. Just, I just threw everything at the wall and, and tried to see what would stick. And from there, it was an editing process. As far as the nasty, interesting man goes, uh, that was the hardest character for me. And I knew that going in, that that character was going to be a difficult uh, one to work through. He feels like a like like that macho Disney villain character. Just this hyper-masculine, um, hyper-perverted and sexual being that I had a hard time grappling with and a hard time wrestling with because every inch of my being just did not want to be that. As far as the tricycle and the stilts go, um, both of those elements are in are baked into the script. So I saw both of them and I went, huh, that's kind of fun. That's kind of interesting. I'm growing! <laughs> There was kind of a back and forth of, would we even be able to find them? Because we couldn't find a tricycle. We were having a hard time finding that, um, at least from what I heard, uh, like just in, in the rehearsal process. And then we were, people were going back and forth on whether or not it would be safe for me to even, to even use stills, even if we could find some. So there was a back and forth on that. There was a time where, I, where, where they were saying, no, we're not going to do stilts. And then as the rehearsal process went on, they approached me and they were like, how would you feel if we tried this? And I went, sure. But it didn't take long for me to really get comfortable with it. And yeah, now I feel like, like when I get on those stilts, it's just essentially like walking. It doesn't feel much different, you know? You know, as far as comparing to other roles that I've done before, I've played characters that I don't like, that give me the heebie-jeebies. I, I had to play a, a misogynist, racist, bigoted character my fall semester, sophomore year. So, so the feeling of walking on stage and saying something or doing something and hearing the audience go, uh, or 
Ew. Or boo. Like, like I'm used to that at this point. Uh, and I'm used to people walking up to me and going, I hated your character. Like, you were the worst. You were awful. And then I go, well, thank you. <laughs> I take that as the highest form of compliment because it's a testament to, like, that I was, that I was being truthful to the story and what the story needed. If I just played it as a good guy or, or didn't go full in um, and played a weak character, then I'm not serving the story um, and I'm not serving the good that is in the story, you know? Not stepping on what she's gonna do, which is, yeah, it's his handwriting. So if I were to be like this, she grabs the letter, comes around, feet, wake up, and then she, or wake up. Um, <laughs> And, and then like, 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 like kind of structure it like, like maybe one to two seconds after she. Yeah, crosses. wait, then she, yeah. then, yeah, you're there. I then mean, so essentially as it. soon as I hear her footsteps. Yeah, you, know, you want to get like, past her, you can turn like, well, where did she go? What happened? Right. And then she says her line. Right. It's his handwriting. It's his handwriting. Well, of course, because then you've moved on to the next thing. Right. So, um, when you say, I have no choice. There's no choice. There is of, no choice of any importance. It's, a, I think it's of any greater importance. <laughs> I don't. Ready, consecutive. I won't okay. challenge you, no. Dinah, no, but no, I'll no, check. No, maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't make sense to me. There's no choice of any importance. What? There is no choice of any importance in life, but the choosing of a okay. beloved. But to the maybe I gotta hear somehow. I'm okay. I'm not sure I'm I'll lift it up more. Nice. Saying facetiously, but also honestly, I'm a very good caster. So I cast students that I was confident would understand her playwriting. Doesn't mean that we haven't had conversations about it. But I think they also understood something about her playwriting that again goes back to, you can't, in my opinion, fully capture it by talking about it. So the necessity of talking about it wasn't always there. Let's just try stuff and try doing it, whatever it is. And we don't even know what it is because it doesn't fit the formula of three-dimensional you know, American realism where people sit around and drink and get drunk and then confess their lives. That's a classic dramaturgical form of a lot of plays written by great American playwrights, but she doesn't follow that uh, formula. But the cast was smart enough, intuitive enough that they got it. And apple oh bottom jeans, jeans, boots with the jeans, with the jeans. No. Got the whole club no. looking at jeans, jeans. <laughs> she hit the jeans. Next thing you jeans, no, got jeans, 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 jeans. So, do you Thank have you notes for this? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, it's great working with Annika. She is smart. I like smart actors. She's disciplined which I think is a professional standard that we should adhere to. Um, I'm not interested in lazy actors, and she's far from lazy. She's reliable, she's disciplined, she works hard, she knows how to take notes, meaning thank you, and I'll keep working on it. Um, there's all those ways in which she knows how to behave in rehearsal, in a professional, mature way when you are playing the leading role, when you are the titular character, you have to be ready for that responsibility, which means, again, you need to model behavior to the rest of the cast, rather than, well, the cast revolves around me because I'm the main character. No, it's the opposite. You have to demonstrate leadership.
it's something that we can intellectually kind of just deal with. It was like you have to just live it. So live it, stand by it, and have a good time. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much, Diana. My name is Annika Decker, and I play Eurydice in Eurydice. On the day we got the cast list, um, obviously, I was really excited, um, but then, you know, nervous all over again because, oh no, now I actually have to do it. Um, and so, definitely, like the first couple of rehearsals, I was also really nervous because I was kind of thinking, like, am I actually good enough to play Eurydice? It has just been really interesting to just figure out, you know, Eurydice's motivations. There's definitely, you know, pressure to be good and do the role justice. Um, and, you know, for me, a lot of that is also like making my director proud. Um, I think Dinah is an amazing director um, and, you know, she always says she's a really good caster. So I was like, well, um, that means she chose me for this role. I hope I can live up to what she thinks I can do. The music came on again? Yes. During the same yeah, I, sequence? What, you're jumping a cue or what? No, I had accidentally count, called the sound and the lights together on the okay. wrong thing. So I, I have bolded it and okay. have fixed it. Yes, but you did call the music for the stream room. Nicely. Okay. Like you waited. Yes. Until he made the decision, or there was something. Yeah, yes. That was yeah. nice. Yeah, I like that. That was nice. He did a nice job too, but you mm -hmm. called it nicely. Um, and the curtain call music was too early. Let let there be a moment. Okay. Yep. Before you bring it up, because it can give you that. Let us before. sit. Yes. Huh? <laughs> can give you that number four. Yes. Yeah. Let right. us sit. It's not not too long, but let us. Yes. Sit. Think about our lives. Two, one, three, four, you know, give us okay. a longer moment. It's okay. not just a flip up. Um, and then obviously don't cut the music at the end. Here. Yes, yes, yeah. Really lovely calls on the uh, following Orpheus before he turns. That yes. we just oh. recently added, that, that's a tricky bit of calling oh, and you did a really nice yeah. job. That, that, that was the best. It's been good before, but that was the best. Yeah, yeah. You've been calling the show really well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> shot, she said. Yeah. No. Yeah, no. Overall, no, so that's like, where hey, that's that, that's yeah. why you get the that's why yeah. you get the low notes is because yeah. you t you keep yourself to such a high standard that when yeah. that when Dinah notices that's that you you those are ones. Yeah, it's okay. That's 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 a good problem there. where we left off, so if we want to start from what do you do, what do you do, the book has already been dropped. It's easy to assume when you first read the play that Eurydice is just very naive, maybe kind of dumb, um, and just like too head over heels in love, whatever you want to call it. I'm not interested in sentimentality. It has to be a genuine, honest vulnerability. And I think Annika has brought that to the role so that you don't go, oh, isn't she sweet? Oh, cute little Eurydice. And I think often, frankly, women are put in that category if they play a certain type of character and their strength in her vulnerability, and there's vulnerability in her strength. <laughs> Orpheus! <laughs> My husband! <laughs> I think you can view it as Eurydice's giving up. She feels like she has nothing left. She doesn't have Orpheus, she doesn't have her father, and obviously she does not want to be involved with the Lord of the Underworld. So you could say it is Eurydice giving up, but I think it is letting go through taking your own agency. 
You think that it's going to change. Like you come back every night thinking that maybe this time they'll get up the end of that like ramp and they'll get back to the overworld. Like every single night. And I feel like this is the way with all classics, like there, it's a reason why it stood the test of time. Something about it speaks to us, whether that's the love component or the idea of like maybe it will change. This play, I think, has been so much of a, of a different experience than any other play that I've done before, I think because of COVID. There are so many lives that were lost from this pandemic, a lot of loved ones that we've had to say goodbye to sooner than we thought. And that's how Orpheus is with Eurydice, that's how Eurydice was with her father. And then again at the end where they all have to say goodbye again, it's, it's hard. I don't know what that models perhaps. It models that we all deal with trauma probably in our lives. And we gotta find healthy ways to get through it. I relate to this play because it's, re it's a reflection on what you lose um, when tragedy happens. Um, and then from there, the question becomes, do you hold on, right? Do you, do you try to hold on to, to what you lost or do you move on?